All right, so let's take a look. We've got a um, question here from Andrew. How does your sensor detect a new device and collect all of its attributes and fingerprints? Is it receiving DHCP requests from the devices to collect info? So that's a great question um, from Andrew. Um, so the answer is no, we do not rely on a DHCP feed. Um, and the reason we really don't need that is because the sensor is actually sitting on a port that is tagged with whatever VLANs you want to monitor. So if you want to monitor three or four or five or 100 VLANs, you tag them on this port. And that means that the sensor is directly layered to adjacent. In other words, it's inside of those network segments. It's in that broadcast domain for those different subnets. And we're listening to all of the broadcast traffic. So what we're doing is we're actually creating nodes because we see there's an IP enabled device on the network. And then we're looking at the characteristics of the broadcast traffic and other information to be able to identify what platform that is. Um, so you're, you're right there when you see the broadcast for DCP, but you see the broadcast for all sorts of other traffic, you're able to make determinations based on that. So um, we do not require you to set up um, a DHCP feed, like take an IP helper and point it to us to ingest that. Um, that's not something you have to do. So you, you, again, you don't have to touch the network to, uh, to get that. And of course we can uh, provide um, deep dives as well um, on how that works, but that's the general answer to, uh, to Andrew's question. And maybe we have another one. Um, let's see. Yeah. And, um, and also, you know, there's common here that Andrew's question is relevant for new equipment deployment out of the box, it would be untrusted. So basically, um, you have, and if, if I think if I'm interpreting this correctly, a couple of different ways to look at this, but your sensor is imaged and pre configured, and then you plug it in. Um, but for other devices, such as a like in, um, if you're going to take a new laptop that is freshly imaged, et cetera, there's ways to make exceptions for those. So you can actually make specific exceptions for those. And you can also, um, for, for devices that are in the process of being imaged, right? So they're not trusted yet. And then you can also uh, poke holes uh, through the permissions for imaging servers, et cetera. So if there's a particular connection that a, a device that is out of the box and needs to be imaged. It needs to connect to an imaging server before it can be imaged and then properly trusted. You can adjust your permissions and even you can assign specific ports or areas in your network that are designated for provisioning uh, new equipment. That, we got a couple of questions that came in in the meantime. Um, one is from Fabio and it says, can you explain or show how Genians can make the difference between an internal network and the internet? We need to make this configuration somewhere. Um, and then we have another question that is, um, well, let me, let me do this because we actually have a few questions coming. So let me answer Fabio. So we don't actually have a um, screenshot of the network object, but to answer Fabio's question, these permissions here that you see um, under the enforcement policy, those are tied to network objects. So you define your internal network address space and you exclude it and that will give them internet only, or you can give them all, or you can only give them access to certain subnets. So um, it actually doesn't list as a column here, but each permission is tied to a logical network object. And that's how you define um, what the permissions will be able to access. Um, we have another question uh, from Young and it says, it seems that this product is based on MAC address is it capable of controlling network access based on user and application as well. So the answer to that is yes. So um, there's different ways that you can employ this. We're showing um, examples for that include some MAC, um, uh, MAC tagging, um, but that is just one approach. So you can actually import um, users from something like Active Directory. You can create user groups and you can then tie user groups based to different uh, permissions, regardless of the Mac, right? So they could be on one or two or three different machines and the permissions can follow the user. So you don't have to use uh, the Mac as part of your policy configuration. 
Um, and there's another question here. What do you do with BACnet, et cetera? That's a great question. So we actually do have, um, uh, if you go to our website and look for device platform intelligence, we have a lot of OT categories in there and you can search through those. Um, but a BACnet is something, um, so I sort of demonstrated that with the limited and the limited OT um, uh, tag here. So you could have something like this, which I actually think might even be a picture of a BACnet router. And you can actually limit it to only one other internal server. So highlighted in blue, one other internal server that it may communicate with and nothing else. So you can, you know, create OT um, type specific policies. Um, and uh, we don't necessarily, there's another question um, from Brent. Um, we don't necessarily use um, IF map, so we don't use that. Um, so it's, uh, it's just not part of the architecture. So we have feeds coming in um, from the information that we're seeing. And also our sensors can go from a monitor to an enforcement mode and can also do some active scanning with NMAP and some other things. Um, but, uh, but if MAP is not one of them. Uh, we actually so do have, we do have some uh, building automation and control devices at City of, okay. but they are, you know, they have their own uh, dedicated VLAN and that VLAN is added to the sensor where, where it's needed. And that's how we detect the, the building automation equipment. So we, sure. as long sure. as it's, you know, visible on the network, the, the Genius right. sensor will pick it up. 